Um, the first reading comes from Luke 19, verse 37 to 40. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The second reading is taken from Luke 23, verses 32 to 43. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, forgive, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled us insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, Lydia, and good evening. Um, it's really great to be with you this evening. Wow, what wonderful words in our passage there. Jesus says this criminal being crucified next to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus' reply, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Wonderful words. And as Stephen mentioned, we've been doing a series on the cross the last three weeks, looking at the power of the cross, last week the beauty of the cross, and this evening the wonder of the cross. And it's also Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is heading somewhere to the wonder of the cross. When my father-in-law was 16 years old, there was a girl that he liked who lived in his neighborhood, and he hadn't managed to ask her out, but he finds out that this girl goes to church. Now, going to church isn't something that my father-in-law does. It's not something his family does. But he finds out this girl goes. And so unexpectedly, one Sunday evening, he follows this girl that he fancies into a church in the centre of London. And he actually ends up going a few weeks in a row. And on the third week that he's there, just because he's followed into church one week, this girl that he likes, on the third week that he's there, he hears this young guy give his first ever sermon. His first ever sermon. And in this sermon, this preacher preaches about the gospel, that there's a God who loves us, who stepped into human history in the person of Jesus. Maybe you're here for the first time in church this evening. Hear the message of the gospel of the God who loves us, of the God who stepped in in Jesus. And my father-in-law is listening to this. And in that moment, unexpectedly, he goes, this is true. This is true. And so he takes himself off to a side room, knowing that he needs to respond to this message that he's heard. And through unexpected tears, he gives his life to Jesus. He responds to Jesus. 16, rocked up in church, not expecting it. And 50 years later, he lives around the corner from us, actually. He's a professor here in the university in Oxford. 50 years later, it's like the wonder of that moment, the wonder of the cross, the wonder of the forgiveness of Jesus just overwhelms him. So I don't know, we'll be gathered around having a family meal and he's the one who's gonna say thanks for the food. And there's this moment and it's like we're all waiting for it where he speaks the name of Jesus and the wonder that this is his story. The wonder just catches his breath and 
<clears throat> he does like a manly throat clear as he tries to carry on praying as the wonder of forgiveness captures him afresh that there he was one day in London just walking into a church following a girl that he likes and he hears the gospel. Slightly awkwardly, the girl that he followed didn't end up becoming my mother-in-law. Um, we don't really talk about her, but God bless that girl. You know, hearing that sermon preached by a guy in his early 20s, his first ever sermon, hearing that sermon changed my father-in-law's life. And you know, words, just a few words can change everything. Our passage has in it words which change everything. The words of this criminal repentant to Jesus on the cross, the words of Jesus to him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise, changes everything. You know, words can change everything, can't they? Like, for example, when you hear, I'm pleased to tell you you've passed your driving test. Or, I'm really sorry to tell you that you failed your driving test. That was me, age 18. Or maybe the words, gold disallowed. You know, when VAR tells you that the injury time goal for the team that you love that was going to secure their place, uh, the promotional place, you know, that that was offside. <laughs> words can change everything. And so here we have them in our passage. Will we hear them afresh on this Palm Sunday, as we begin our week, as we head towards Good Friday and Easter Sunday, as we look this evening at the wonder of the cross, will we be hit afresh by the wonder of these words which change us, which go on changing us, which might be changing you this evening for the very first time. And so the first thing we see in our passages is the wonder of the one who's on the cross, the one who's there. Who is it? that's on the cross. This is God. This is Jesus. God in a person who stepped into human history. God, they're giving his life for us. The one here on the cross is the king of the universe. And our first passage, that Palm Sunday reading, pick that up in Luke 19. Maybe you've got a Bible or on your phone. Turn there with me where we read in verse 37 this. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices, for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, <clears throat> glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replies, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You see, our Palm Sunday reading here shows us that the crowds, who is the one who in a few days time would be on the cross where the crowds get it, that this is no ordinary man. They mentioned verse 37, the miracles that Jesus had done. They mentioned verse 38, that this is the king. Blessed be the king. Hosanna to the king, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And what's this in verse 40 about stones? <laughs> that the stones will cry? Well, it's telling us that the coming of this king will have an impact on the whole of creation. The whole of creation acknowledges that the wonder of the one on the cross is the king of the universe. And this Palm Sunday moment, this reading, is a fulfillment of a prophecy hundreds of years old by the prophet Zechariah, which means God remembered. This prophecy showing that God is sovereign over human history, working out his purposes through the wonder of the one who is on the cross, God for us, in our place, dying for us through his love for us. And you see the acknowledgement here, this Palm Sunday acknowledgement that Jesus is King carries on in our second passage in Luke 23, where we read that the shouts of the crowd, here comes the king, become the words that are written above Jesus's head, where it says in verse 38, there was written a notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. And then the criminal says these surprising words in verse 41, were punished justly, for we're getting this punishment, we're here being crucified, says this criminal, for what our deeds deserve, but Look what he says about Jesus. This man's done nothing wrong. It begs an interesting question, doesn't it? How did this criminal know this about Jesus? What's the story here? Had he heard the crowds on Palm Sunday just a few days before acknowledging that this is the King, the Holy One of God, that here he is here being crucified next to him? Maybe this criminal next to Jesus had witnessed some miracles. Maybe he'd heard some of Jesus' teaching, or I don't know, maybe his story is like that of the Roman centurion who watches the way that Jesus dies. 
always at every turn perfectly holy, full of love, full of forgiveness, full of compassion. You see, the wonder of the one on the cross is that the one who is there is one who is like us, but not like us. One who is like us in that he shares in our suffering, he becomes human. This is God in a person identifying with us, sharing our suffering, sharing our grief, but here also on the cross is one who is so very different from us, perfect in innocence, perfectly holy, so that he can be the one to save us, like us, yet so different from us. When our son uh, was nearly four, I was praying with him at bedtime, and I said to him, okay, Morgan, what should we thank God for? And he replied, football. So I said, of course, thank you, God, for football. I finished that off, and then he said, why don't we say thank you for Jesus? I was like, oh, it's a good surprise. You know, normally, it's just football and whatever he had eaten for dinner that night. And so I, I thought, well, I'm going to just explore a bit here. Um, you know, how's he doing in terms of his understanding of propitiation for sin? What about the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit when we participate in Christ? What about the covenant being ratified in Jesus? You know, where's he at with these things? <laughs> and so I um, knelt down by his cot bed, <laughs> and I just asked him this question. Morgan, what do you know about Jesus? And this is exactly what he said. He paused and he looked at me and said, I know that he is good and that he loves me. And here on the cross, the wonder of the one on the cross, here the wonder again this evening is that here is the goodness of Jesus. The love of Jesus fleshed out for us in this moment. We see it here. We see it in the humility of Jesus, riding humbly on a donkey, Riding into Jerusalem, we see it here as Jesus is flanked by criminals. You know, this moment of Jesus' crucifixion is called in Scripture, Jesus' glory. But who's either side of him? Who's he flanked by? Criminals. It doesn't look like that on the royal balcony. No, the royals stand there together sharing their status. But here is Jesus, smack bang in the middle of two criminals. What a wonderful picture of why he came. He came for sinners. He came for those down and out. He came for us all. He came flanked by criminals. There he is. You see, when we look at the cross and we see, as we see in our passage, the insults hurled at him, the teasing and the taunting that he receives, the humiliation as we read it there, we see that on the cross, this moment, the wonder of it all, is that the cross isn't the moment where Jesus loses his divinity. No, this is where we see what true divinity looks like. The true fleshing out of love and goodness. And so I wonder then this evening, for those of us who would say Jesus is my king, are we becoming more like him? In humility, in gentleness, becoming more and more each and every day as the Holy Spirit works within us, like our king, humble, like our king, good. Like our king, loving. And so firstly, the wonder of the one on the cross. And secondly, in our passages, we see the wonder of the one who remembers us. We read in verse 42 of Luke 23, then the criminal said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That word remember is used quite a bit throughout scripture in relation to God. And it doesn't mean when we understand the sort of uh, etymology of that word, it doesn't mean to remember here to kind of recall to mind something you've forgotten. No, it means having at the forefront of your mind someone or something, having it right there at the front of your mind that it leads to action. You know, feeling forgotten is not a great feeling, is it? You know that uh, we've all been there, haven't we? That sense of feeling overlooked or forgotten where the thoughts go through our mind, oh, if only they thought of me, then maybe they'd have behaved a bit differently. Or maybe we think to ourselves, oh, it's like sometimes I'm not even in the room. <laughs> or they clearly think more highly of that person than they do of me. Or, you know, we've all done the Instagram scroll where we see all of our friends hanging out together and wonder, why did they not include me? Feeling forgotten isn't a great feeling, but the wonder of the cross is that in the way that matters most, in the way that matters most, you have been remembered. In the way that matters most, you have been remembered. Remembered here 
Jesus, remember me, says this criminal. And you know, if we know a love like that, a love which has us at the forefront of the mind of God, the, the one who stepped in to save us, if we know that love, if we're in that love, do you know, knowing a love like that, it bit by bit heals us, makes us more secure, heals our insecurities, holds us, grounds us, roots us, holds us secure. So we can find ourselves in a tricky conversation where those sort of feelings emerge perhaps of insecurity or struggle or, or doubt or wondering and we can ground ourselves in the fact that we are known and loved and seen and remembered by the God of it all who showed that in human history through his love poured out for us in Jesus. We can find ourselves in the office tomorrow, grounded and rooted and secure in the fact that we are on the mind of God. How wonderful. We can find ourselves waiting for that news in the doctor's surgery, knowing that we are on the mind of God. It's like an anchor, isn't it, the cross? It's like this anchor which holds us secure. You know, the waves will come in life, won't they? Waves of financial struggle, waves of health difficulties, waves of, I don't know, difficult relational struggle, whatever it might be, they, they come, those waves, but we can be rooted and secure and grounded in the anchor that is the cross, the wonder of the one who remembers us. And from that place, we can find ourselves acting more in generosity, acting more in love ourselves. We're secure, so we can reach out in love. We're secure, so we can step out courageously. We're secure, and so we can pray and know God's presence by his spirit and his help. In scripture, you see, when it talks about God remembering, the plea, the cry here of this criminal being crucified next to Jesus, when it speaks throughout scripture of God remembering, it talks about how God comes through because of his character, because of what God is like. It, God comes through because of his glory. God comes through because of keeping his covenant pro promise, his faithfulness to his people. And so we read in the Bible that God remembered Noah and the waters receded. We read in the Bible that God remembered Rachel and he opened her womb. We read that God remembered his people in Egypt and he sent Moses to deliver them. And interestingly, in Luke's gospel, the one that we're in this evening, at the very beginning, we read that Zechariah hears this promise that his son John is going to be the one to prepare the way for the coming Messiah, the one who would bring ultimate deliverance for his people, the one who would step in and save from sin and from death. And what does Zechariah mean? God remembers. God remembers. Here it is. On the cross, the wonder of the cross, we see God step in in the way that matters most to save us from sin and death. And God remembers, God has you, he has me on his mind as he's there on the cross. You see, scripture says, God will forget our sin because in Christ, he's remembered us. Jesus, remember me, says the criminal. Remember me. And so at the start of this Holy Week, we're gonna, in a moment, gather at the table and remember him. So the wonder of the one on the cross, the wonder of the one who remembers us, and then thirdly, the wonder that Jesus is enough that Jesus is enough. Verse 33 says, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. <clears throat> Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And there's that criminal's cry, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then here is Jesus's response, words that change everything. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Truly, not maybe, but if you could just go get your CV first. Truly, not maybe, but let's just see how the next few moments work out. No, truly, you will be with me because Jesus is the one that makes the difference here. Not what we bring, but what he has done for us. One of uh, my favorite YouTubes, you know, we've all got our faves, haven't we? Our, our TikTok um, videos. One of my favorite ones is um, a clip from a sermon. <laughs> by a, a guy, a preacher called Alistair Begg. It actually went viral a few years ago. You can check it out. 
And it's off the back of this passage where this Scottish preacher, Alistair Begg, imagines the scene. And so he imagines, Begg, this scene where the thief on the cross here, he rocks up to the gates of heaven and he's met by an angel. This is what Alistair Begg is imagining in this moment. And the angel's there and he gets his list as he sees the thief come forward and he's like, uh, your name? And he checks his list and says, your, your name isn't on the list. And so he's like, hold on a second, just get my supervisor angel. And so he uh, goes and gets the supervising angel and Begg carries on imagining the scene and says that the supervising angel just says, okay, just a few questions to the thief who stood there waiting at the gates of heaven. Um, if you could just tell me your grasp of uh, the doctrine of justification by faith, please. And the thief looks a little bit vague. He says, okay, well, uh, if you tell me, please, uh, something about the doctrine of scripture, the thief looks back a little vague. And Begg carries on telling the story, imagining that now the supervising angel is getting a little bit irritated. And so he says, as he looks at the thief, on whose authority then have you come here? And the thief replies, the man on the middle cross told me I could come. The man on the middle cross told me I could come because Jesus and his work and his saving grace for us is enough. You see, we don't need to bring a track record or our achievements. The wonder of the cross, hear this afresh this week or perhaps for the first time, is that it isn't about what we bring, our achievements or our lack of them, our successes or our lack of them. It's not about us coming, but it's about Jesus and those words that we have in our passage that he cries, Father, forgive them. For that is what we need, forgiveness from sin, entering into the love and presence of God, forgiveness from sin, freedom. And that's what Jesus' death achieves. That is the breathless wonder of forgiveness. That is the breathless wonder of forgiveness that Jesus is enough, that it doesn't depend upon us, that it isn't what we bring, but it's all what he has done. You see, the promise here from Jesus is, today you'll be with me in paradise, a return to the beginning in Genesis, that image of perfect communion that the first humans had, perfect communion, perfect friendship with Jesus, that safety, the thief here, is being promised, that safety in the presence of Jesus, that safety in the presence of Jesus, even in their imminent death, that safety in the presence of Jesus, even as they wait for the bodily resurrection that Jesus would inaugurate just a few days later when he is bodily raised, that safety in the presence of Jesus that would last in the new creation for all eternity. You see, Jesus is enough. We hear a lot, don't we, in our culture, the phrase or the sentence, you're enough. And I love it because it underlines that we are valuable, that we should be treasured, that we shouldn't be trampled on, that we're important, that we're unique. But actually, there's a better word to hear that changes everything. And that is that Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. When we can't make it on our own, Jesus is enough. When we have failed, Jesus is enough for all of our questions. And you see, when we remind ourselves at that, the start of this holy week, we avoid two temptations. The one of sitting in despair, that we only bring mess and what can we do with that and self-loathing and, and, and despair or the other temptation of our arrogance and thinking, well, I've got this and I can bring this and I could show you this. No, if we remind ourselves that Jesus is enough, then we rest in what he has done. And we know a deeper freedom and a deeper joy and a deeper safety and security in his presence. I love the words. I've been playing it a lot <laughs> this weekend of Brooke Liggettworth's song, Calvary, as in the place where Jesus died, Calvary's enough. She writes this, when I know nothing, when I know too much, what I choose to know right now is Calvary's enough. Jesus is enough. When I know nothing, like a four-year-old child, <laughs> when I know nothing, like a criminal, for the first time responding to this breathless wonder of forgiveness, or when I know too much, like the, the Pharisees in our first passage who are puffed up in their knowledge and miss the moment and miss who Jesus is. Or what about when I know too much of the world's brokenness into all of those things? Too much. 
too little. Jesus is enough. He is sufficient. He is enough for a 16-year-old who wanders into a London church. Now, enough for an Oxford professor, enough for a four-year-old lad, enough for a criminal, enough for me, enough for you, enough for our sin, enough for our shame, enough for today, enough for tomorrow, always enough, forever enough. Jesus is enough. That is the wonder of the cross. And so as we continue in this Holy Week, know afresh the wonder of the cross. Invite someone perhaps to know it themselves. You know, around this time of year, I was sat with a friend in a park. It was um, uh, sunny like it's been today. And she was a friend, not yet a Christian. I met her a couple of years ago. Our kids go to the same school. And she was sharing with me something that was worrying her. It was actually quite an exciting adventure, but she was telling me about all the research that she'd done uh, to kind of mitigate against different circumstances. She'd been looking on Google extensively, on Google Maps to map out different timings and different plans. She had lists. She had lists for her lists. And as she was saying all this out loud, she started laughing. (laughs) But then the laughter turned into tears, and she said to me, Laura, this is what I'm like. You know, how can I know peace? And I responded to her and said, well, you probably know what I'm about to say right now. And then she laughed and said, maybe something about prayer and about Jesus. And I said to her, identifying with her worry and said how prayer had helped me in certain moments of of my life, in the worry and uncertainty of what lies ahead. And then I said this sentence to her. I said, you know, ultimately, everything can be okay. And she kind of interrupted and laughed and said, well, I'm not so sure about that. And then I replied, well, not in the sense that life is always easy or that there aren't struggles, but in the sense that, that Jesus, and just as I said that, our kids ran back from where they were playing in the park. I didn't get to finish my sentence, but you know, I hope one day I get to, because that is all it takes, words, a sentence, which change everything. Maybe you're hearing them tonight for the first time. Will you respond? Maybe you have a colleague, a family member, a friend, someone in your flat share who needs to hear these words that will change their life. Who will you invite to come and see, to see the wonder of the cross, the one there for us, the one who remembers us, who we remember this Holy Week and Easter. Amen.